Please join me in the call to worship. Jesus Christ is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Jesus Christ who rules over all things. Jesus Christ is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Let us offer our praise and thanksgiving. Jesus, my Savior, you came down to earth to save me and told me to have faith in you. You said that with faith, I can even say to the mountain, go, throw yourself into the sea, and it will be done. My mind knows that if I believe, trust, and have faith in you, I will receive whatever I ask, for in your name, I, I believe in you, Jesus. I believe that you are Lord. You are the God Most High. You are the creator of heaven and earth. Erase my doubt, Jesus. Take it all away. Help my unbelief. I deliver myself into your righteous hands. Amen. Please join me in the first hymn, number 569 in the Green Books. God of grace and God of glory. Join me in the call to confession. Looking at Jesus, we see that we have fallen short of the glory of God. 
Yet Jesus looks at us with mercy and grace. Therefore, let us offer our confession in faith. God of justice and righteousness, you lift up the lowly and fill the empty. You reach out to the poor, yet we sleaselessly pursue wealth. You talk about treasure in heaven, yet we want dollars in our accounts right now. Correct our misguided ways. Forgive us from striving for more and more. Change our hearts so that we can tend to things that matter and find our life in Jesus Christ. Let us offer our silent prayers. <clears throat> Without regard for the cost, the precious love of God is poured out in Jesus Christ. This is the good news. <clears throat> And now let us, since Jesus Christ has given us this peace, let us turn to one another and offer this peace by turning around to one another and saying the words, the peace of Christ is yours today. 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 Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. Amen. <clears throat> well, it's nice to be here. I enjoy coming to Waldport. Uh, it was a little, uh, I, the timing was a little off. It's just a little further than I thought, so I was a few minutes uh, past what I wanted to be here, but it's always good to be here at Waldport, and I enjoy this uh, church. <clears throat> so what I'd like to do today is to take the whole chapter of John 14 and read that to you and just stay with one passage today rather than doing the various lectionary passages. So listen for the Word of God in John 14, 1 through 29. <clears throat> Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. And Jesus said to him, Have I have been with you all this time, Philip, and you do still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. 
Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I did and in fact will do greater works than these because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name so that my Father may be glorified in the Son. If in, your, if in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live. You also will live. On that day, you will know that I am the Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. And those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will reveal yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus answered him, those who love me will keep my word and my father will love them and will come to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words and the word that you hear is not mine, but is from the father who sent me. I have said these things to you while I am still with you. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away and I am coming to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father because the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you this before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> this is a familiar passage that I believe everybody has heard many times. Uh, it is spoken in most uh, Memorial and funeral services. It is the one passage that is read. Uh, we usually, in fact, it was uh, read if you saw the Queen Elizabeth's uh, service. You know that this was the primary scripture that they also used in her service. And what's interesting is, is that the prayers and the scriptures that they use in the, in the Episcopal Church, the Church of England, are very old, but they're the same ones that we use when we do the, the services. But we usually only hear verses 1 through 6, and we have that familiar verse, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then we jump to verses 25 to 27, and we read, a uh, famous uh, verse, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. Those are the familiar verses, the familiar passage. But when one reads the complete chapter of John 14, one can begin to see the connection of the verses and new meanings emerge. And it seems that John layers one thing after the other and his thoughts keep coming out and then they keep stacking and yet another thought and a new thought until we see a complete picture of our relationship with God. <clears throat> so one of the great, great questions when we face the trials and tribulations and, and, and why would this passage is read so, so much is, it, is the question, um, can we trust God? And so I think this chapter addresses this question and what it means to trust God. He begins with the chapter, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In other words, trust me. So let's explore that then as we look at the whole 
chapter 14. In verses 2 and 3, Jesus says he's leaving and going to prepare a place for us. This implies that we're going to meet God perhaps later. And that we're going to wait for that day as he prepares a place for us. And so we begin our life preparing and anticipating that day when we would meet God who has prepared a place for us. <clears throat> but then we read verse 23. Those who love me will keep my word and my father will love them. We will come to them and make a home with them. So now we can see that God is present with us today in this passage. Here, he will be with us and he will come to us and, is, and he will make a home with us. So one of the first grief questions is, where is God? So some would say, well, we're waiting until we die and get to heaven. And we're preparing ourselves for that day to meet God face to face. And then we will see God. When we say, where is God? We just have faith to believe. One, one other people might say, God is here present in the now, as in verse 23. And that we can be with God today. And God is with us today. And then some would say, well, I don't see God today. But then we look in the past and we begin to see our God working in our past and these mighty acts. And we say, well, I, I don't see God now. I'm not sure about the future. But I do know that God has been in my life in the past. And that's where I see God. So basically we're saying then that God is with us. In the past, God is with us in the present, and God will be with us in the future. So God is with us, past, present, and future. Well, I attended a conference a few years ago, and it was, it, it was uh, titled, uh, What Makes Us Human Beings? Well, the speaker spoke about artificial intelligence and robots. And they were teaching this robot how to learn, discussing what separates us from the robot and what makes us human. It used to be that what made us human beings that separated us was that we were rational human beings. We were able to think. And Descartes even said, I think, therefore I exist. And that's what separates us from other creatures. That's what makes us human. But this conference, the speaker was, was saying that no, maybe what makes us human is relationships. Maybe relationships define what makes us human. Well, you know, the problem with relationships is that's the most difficult part of our life. What happens when relationships are betrayed? Is it, it's harder to trust and harder to love again. So when we want to develop a relationship with this God that's with us in the past, present, and future, and we have a relationship, we're scared. Is God going to be there? Where is God? Can we trust God? If God was, believing in God was a legal contract, it would be so much easier. I'll do this and you do this. In fact, some religions do that. They, they reduce God to a legal contract. In fact, Moses did that. In fact, we had that legal contract in the Old Testament. But then Jeremiah writes that God was going to give us a new covenant. He will not make a covenant like he did with Moses. But the Lord will put my heart within them, my word within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. In other words, I'm going to establish a relationship. So, so God being present is not someone way off, someone that we're going to meet, somebody who is our crutch that we just call upon when we need him. But it is a total relationship with God. 
I always tell this example about relationships and trust. I had a diver and she was very good and she had a great signature dive which was a double somersault off the one meter board where you go around twice and you go in feet first. Well, she wanted to do that on the three meter board. And what happens when you're a coach is you, a lot of times you call the diver out because they're, so they know when to open up. So I said, okay, I'll call you out. So she goes up on the high dive to do this double somersault. Most people do a two and a half. In other words, they go around and then they go in head first, but she wanted to do a double. So I said, okay, I'll call you out. Well, she goes up, she spins a little slower than usual, and I got a little more nervous than usual, and I went, now! And she opened up like this, flat. And she went, boom, flat on her back, completely. And she came up crying and she goes, I trusted you, I trusted you. And so I'm sitting there going, wow, am I ever going to get her trust back? So relationships are difficult, <clears throat> but that's what God is asking us to do. You know, our pandemic is not the first pandemic in history. We've learned that. We know there was one in 1918, and there's been many pandemics over the course of human history. One of them, of course, was a famous one, the Black Death. In the, in the Middle Ages that wiped out huge populations. Well, there's a theologian, Occam, in the 11th century, who is sometimes attributed to being the beginning of technology, the beginning of studying the ways in which we can figure it out for ourselves because people couldn't trust God. They were getting wiped out. The Black Death was taking their neighbors and their friends and their families, and they said, we can't trust God. And so they developed a theology that said, well, we just need to take care of ourselves. And if you think about it today, when there's a problem, we immediately say technology can fix it. It's not that the future is that God will be there, but it's more that we will discover the cure someday. And the other thing that's happened is the advance, advancement of mathematics and algorithms. There was an article in the New Yorker that talked about economists that believe that efficiency is the answer to our complicated society. That if we can reduce it to a bunch of mathematical formulas, we can make it so it's not so complicated and we will become more efficient. The author stated in this article, there has always been something irresistible about a mathematical form. He quotes Genesis. When in the book of Genesis, Joseph was plucked from prison to interpret the dreams for Pharaoh. He offered some biblical budgeting. He said, to survive the seven years of famine that will come after seven years of abundance, the Egyptians must save exactly one-fifth of their harvest. So they believed in the numbers in order for the Egyptians to get out of that drought. He went on to say, that efficiency should be considered a value. A value. That we should value efficiency. And then I went on to think, well, we also believe we should value technology. And the thing is, we don't question society's value systems. But then the article went on to say, relationships are a value. They are a value system of a society. But sometimes we sacrifice relationships for efficiency and we've given all of our answers to our problems 
to the scientists and the economists. Um, a good example is Walmart. Sam Walton used to say, I read, I really should write these down in case anybody asked me, where did you read that? Read that if three people are in line at a cashier's line, then you are to set up another teller or another cashier. Also, if you remember, now it hasn't happened at all lately, they used to have a greeter. You would walk in and they believed that you would do less shop shoplifting if you established a relationship as you came into the store. So they had a greeter that would say, hello, how are you today? And you'd say, oh, hi, you're establishing a relationship. That's how they curbed shoplifting. So it wasn't all, you know, hey, we're, we're good people and we want to establish relationships. But what's interesting is as I was at Walmart, 10 o'clock in the morning, there's probably 10 people in line and one, tell, one cashier. And I'm going, and I happen to be standing next to the manager. And I said, uh, how come you don't open up another ca uh, tell, a cashier uh, when there's like three people or, or you know, like that? And she goes, well, we don't have anybody here because the algorithm, she didn't use that word, but that's what she meant. The math tells us that at 10 o'clock we only have X amount of people, so we only need this X amount of employees. They'll be here at 11 o'clock when the math tells us more people are gonna show up. Then we'll hire the guy to come here at 11 o'clock. So what happened to the relationship? What happened to Sam Walton who said, hey, if there's three people in line, we're gonna open up another cashier. So nobody stays longer than three people in line. See, we have moved, we have moved to the algorithm and the efficiency instead of the relationships. But you know, it's still not new. That's why it's important to read this whole passage because here it is in, in, in this passage, Philip says, Lord, show us the Father, then we'll be satisfied. In other words, show us the numbers, give us the proof. That's what Philip is saying to Jesus. Show us the Father and then we'll have proof, then we'll know. And Jesus responds, I and the, and the Father are one. Relational statement. You want numbers, I'm telling you, I and the Father are one. I'm telling you, it's a relationship that I have with my Father. And if you have seen me, then you have seen the Father. If you've had a relationship with me, then you've had a relationship with the Father. People will see me through you and through your relationships with one another. And through these network of relationships with God and with others, we'll have this new concept. I wrote that down. And then I realized, no, wait, that's techno language. We don't want to say new concept. We want to say that we're, we'll have a new understanding of our relationship with God. You know, the other thing that crept into our theology in modern theology is, is that when science came in in its full force in the 17th and 18th century, religion had to compete with science. They had to prove that no, we're not just a mystic uh, mythology, but that in fact the Bible and religion has scientific evidence. So they begin to interpret the Bible with scientific vigor. They begin with textual criticism and literary criticism, something that would show us that we were rational human beings and therefore God and the world is rational. God created the world out of chaos and gave it order and now we can scientifically figure out everything about the world and about God with as we reach and, and we, we explore everything with those scientific and economic principles. And so we felt that economics and technology will fix everything, then the theologians packaged it into theological language. But you see, relational thinking is not new because in the Eastern Orthodox Church, 
it's a very much more relational uh, sect, uh, part of our Christianity than the West. And they have a, they, they talk in relational terms with God and they have the icons and the icon wall and you develop a relationship with the saints and with the community of saints. We even talk about the community of saints. So we talk about the relationships of people uh, past, present, and future. Well, they have an icon called the Trinity icon, which is my favorite icon. It's three people sitting at a table. Now, some think it's the prophets. Some, I thought, always thought it was the Holy Trinity, but now I've heard that it's not. It could be the prophets in the Old Testament. But there's an opening and a place for me. So sometimes I look at that and I think, you know, I think I'll just sit in the place that's for me and be in relationship with those three as I pray. See, in the passage that we just said, Philip is saying, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. If that is not enough for you, just see what I've done. See the miracles I perform. See these things. Doesn't that let you know that I love you and the Father loves you because I am in the Father and the Father is in me. So if you want to know, if you are in the Father and the Father is in me, Develop relationships with one another. Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot. Judas not Iscariot. I'm sorry, not the one that he betrayed Jesus. Says, how come you reveal yourself to us and the world? Isn't that something we also figured out? How come you only only come to certain people, God, and how come other people, we go talk to them and they don't believe? How, how, how does that work? Why does God show himself to some and not to others? And the answer in the scriptures is, those who love me will keep my word and my Father will love them. In other words, relationships. Those who love me. It's about loving because you need to love in order to listen to God. Those who don't see me and think I have revealed myself to them don't love me. And then I can't get through to them. So the beginning of the relationship with God then is to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. The beginning of any relationship is to care. So if you love me, it goes on to say, you'll keep my commandments and I will ask the Father and I will give you an advocate. He he introduces the third person of the Trinity. To be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him. You know him because he abides in you and he will be in you. He's establishing a relationship for us with the Holy Spirit. And so it takes trust. Relationships take trust. This whole passage is about trust. Can we trust God? Yes, we can trust God. And we can trust Jesus because he is sending us the Holy Spirit to help us with this process of relationships. How does this whole passage begin? Asking us to believe. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. And then at the end of the chapter, he says, and now I've told you all these things before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe. He begins to say believe, but at the end he says, I'm telling you all of these things, I'm showing you all these things, so that you can believe. So we don't have to be afraid of the now, because God is with us. We can let go of the past, because God's redeemed the past. We don't have to be afraid of the future because we know God is preparing a place for us. So he can leave us with these words, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. So whether we see God in the past, feel God in the present, or anticipate meeting God in the future, we can always trust God who gives us this peace that passes all understanding. Amen.
And now let us sing, Trust and Obey. It's found in the green hymnal, number 443. one announcement that's been given to me and that is on Saturday's breakfast on the uh, the 24th uh, 83 people were fed 39 boxes fed 81 people and served 42 families so that is really special for this church um, are there other announcements uh, you can see them on the back and I refer you to them uh, is there any that somebody wants to elaborate on uh, for this morning? Yes. May I say that we have been so blessed at breakfast with new volunteers. It, the numbers we fed went up, and now the numbers that are helping us are going up. But we do have a small need we were hoping the congregation could help with. We are short on paper bags and those plastic grocery bags. So if you have some at home, if you would bring them across the box, we would be very grateful. Let me repeat that for the microphone, that uh, you have more people, but also more volunteers. 
and you're asking that if anybody has the grocery bags and the paper sacks to drop them off at the church. Okay, great. Any other things that you want to highlight this morning? If not, then we'll take a moment for mission. Well, as most of you know, this season is uh, um, uh, a time of uh, giving for the uh, uh, Peace and uh, Global Witness uh, special offering. And uh, 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 there's, a, uh, there's a leaflet uh, in your bulletin that indicates that uh, uh, this Peace and uh, Global Witness uh, offering allows us to join with other Presbyterians throughout the world uh, in uh, giving to uh, 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 promote uh, the peace of Christ by addressing uh, uh, systems of injustice in, in our own communities and across the world. Uh, this 25% this, uh, uh, of this offering uh, for our community uh, stays with our community and that will be given to uh, our sister's place which is a, a, a place of, uh, uh, of, uh, of safety and, and assurance for uh, many uh, uh, women and, and, and their families uh, that are facing uh, uh, real trials of injustice. 25% uh, uh, of the offering also goes to uh, the uh, a northwest region of uh, Presbyterians and uh, that goes to uh, uh, areas uh, that face injustice and problems uh, uh, right in our area also. Uh, the 50 percent remaining goes around the world um, and uh, that supports the work for peace and rec reconciliation uh, and that's being done by Presbyterians across the globe. So if you would, uh, uh, in your thoughts and prayers, uh, keep the, uh, this offering and, uh, uh, and we look forward to, uh, uh, to the, uh, the help that it gives to our communities and other communities too. Thank you. And next we'll have our prayers for the people. Are there prayers that people would like to share? If not, then let us prepare ourselves for prayer. Lord, we come to you this day thankful for the many gifts that you have given us and for the many times that we have seen your presence among us through our friends, through our family, through the works of the church, through helping others, who perhaps are going through uh, difficult times, to those that they fed, we offer thanksgiving for all those volunteers, we ask blessings uh, for those that were here, we ask blessings for the sisters uh, place, and for all those we ask as we reach out to them we're thankful, Lord, that we're able to help. We ask that you use our money wisely as we give these gifts. And Lord, we offer special prayers for the world, for we know that with the way social media and the media is today, we, we can just not ignore the things of the world. But so we offer these prayers, and we offer prayers for Ukraine and for Iran, for other places of unrest. We lift them up to you, and for Russia, we lift them up to you, and we pray, Lord, that safety of all those who 
who are involved in the conflict. We pray that the, those who are leading, that they will come to some conclusions to end the conflicts. Lord, we just lift up those prayers to you for that. And Lord, we pray for our own uh, United States and for our people here as we lift it up to you, as we all seek peace, the peace that you have given us that passes all understanding. And Lord, this day, we also offer prayers for those those that are less fortunate than ours, us, and we lift them up to you this day that you bring them safety too on the streets, if that's where they are, and the homeless, and we offer prayers for them. We pray, Lord, also for for those who lead and for our uh, as our elections draw near we pray Lord that you lift up the people that uh, you would have lead our nation and so we offer this prayers O Lord in Jesus Christ name who offered this prayer saying our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, now is the time for the offering. And as you know, with, with our COVID pro protocols, I've Every church now, I notice, uh, no longer passes the plate, but they have a plate in the back, and please give generously. And also, there's other ways to give through the mail, etc. So we hope that you'll keep that in mind for this church. And also, think about service, and it, and it sounds like this church is uh, very service-oriented, so we, we're thankful for that. And you can also give of your time as well as your money. So, so that's what this all means when we, uh, we give of our offerings at this time. And now let us all join in the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God church here below. Praise God ye heavenly heavenly Let us pray, O Lord, accept our gifts of time, talents, and money, that they may be used to further your, your kingdom here on earth. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now our closing hymn is 717 in the green hymnal. Did that hymn just summarize my sermon or what? I didn't even, I had ever sung that one. And now go in peace and serve the Lord and rejoice in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, 
and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.